So, in case you didn't happen to catch the thumbnail, this is my absolute favorite episode in all of Steven Universe. As such, while I'm going to try and continue to be as fair as possible, and my co-writer is going to help balance things out a little with his more neutral viewpoint on this episode, I'm letting you know now that I'm very biased in favor of this episode, and thus that may show at several points. So, let's begin. Lion, you can't chew this up. How else am I going to remember the time I rode the Thunderbird at Funland? If that shirt was so important to you, how was Lion able to grab it from up here without you noticing? If it was put somewhere else or you didn't notice it was gone from the spot where you put it, then clearly you don't care about it as much as you say you do. Now it'll be safe forever, hanging in this perfectly stable magic tree. <laughs> So they're finally addressing this gem inside Lion's Mane, which despite how much I love this episode, is still very strange timing. At this point, Steven's either completely ignored this gem inside Lion's Mane for almost two seasons, or he somehow didn't see it even once. Since the latter is highly unlikely, even I respect Steven's intelligence more than that, did he just never bring this up to the gems for some reason? How? Steven is a very inquisitive kid. I'm 99.9% .9 certain that this would have come up at least once in passing at the very least. A counterpoint to this might be that Steven just thought it was a corrupted gem and so didn't really question it much. But A, I find it very hard to believe that Steven didn't at least ask the gems what something like that was doing in his fucking pet lion. And B, even if Steven somehow didn't ask them, you'd think he would at least want the bubble to be in the temple with the rest of them to heal them later. It's very surprising and honestly a little unrealistic that it took this long for this to happen. Jump! Jump! I am jumping! Not only are you not moving on screen, but you're not even pressing any buttons. How are you jumping? Also, where did Lion get this other shirt from? Steven's closet isn't open, his drawers are shut, and there weren't any other shirts lying around anywhere. I absolutely love this title card. Its uniqueness fits this episode so well. It pulls double duty and not only serving as an introduction to who this gem is, but also sets the tone perfectly with the mysterious and somewhat ominous music that plays in the background. It's so damn good. I also adore Bismuth's design here. The details help in giving you a basic rundown of certain aspects of her character. The stars throughout her body instantly communicate that she's a crystal gem. Her apron hints towards her role in the crystal gems and her interest in blacksmithery. It's these nice little details that make a great character design. Where the hell did she come from? She wasn't behind Steven and he looked around pretty thoroughly. I doubt she could really hide anywhere. I love Lion's face as Steven pulls Bismuth out here. He's just like, what the fuck did I eat? I also love this whole scene. The writing is pretty superb and feels like just a group of friends naturally talking together. Really great stuff. Rose said she lost track of you at the battle for the ziggurat. She was worried sick. If we consider that right now, Bismuth is coming right off the heels of a very heated argument with Rose that led to Rose literally stabbing her, it's strange how Bismuth is acting really damn level-headed here. When it comes to a harrowing experience such as being stabbed by your leader, you'd think Bismuth would be acting a little more frantic and focused on figuring out where Rose is and what she's doing. Maybe Bismuth got caught up in keeping up a calm appearance near the Crystal G gems, and I can kind of see that, but there should be at least some signs of stress, right? We get a more stressed expression on her face, but that appears slightly too late for it to be realistic. It only came up after Rose was not only mentioned, but also when Bismuth learned of the excuse she came up with. Shouldn't Bismuth at least have Rose somewhat on her mind at this point, at the very least? Also, this excuse doesn't hold up even slightly when you apply a little thinking to it, but Steven doesn't think to interject here. He literally found Bismuth inside of Lion's Mane. Why would Rose have put Bismuth there if she had just poofed in a regular battle? Why not put her in the temple? Why even bubble her in the first place? And yet Steven doesn't bring this up. The crystal gems seem entirely too quick to just accept Bismuth being back without questioning anything. And yeah, that may make a little sense for Pearl and Garnet who are just happy to have her back, but not only would Steven's hesitation for a good portion of this episode have warranted a little bit of thought towards this, but why do Pearl and Garnet not question why one of their best friends was in Rose's possession without either of them being told? Isn't Pearl super sensitive about all of Rose's secrets not being told to her? Why aren't any alarm bells going off here? 
It's not always easy to understand Rose's choices, but we have to stand behind them. Rose really is something else. I mean, look at this. She really is something else. Continuing on the trend of the gems being way too quick to accept things, why does Bismuth just believe the gems here? Look, I get it. Bismuth doesn't seem like the type to immediately think that what her friends say is bullshit. But again, she was stabbed by her fucking leader that she trusts. I would think her willingness to trust what other people say at face value would be a little worn by now. Especially with an explanation like, oh, Rose is someone else now, lol. Don't think about it too much. I know I'm being very harsh here towards my favorite episode, but it being my favorite doesn't mean I just ignore flaws like this, you know? Where is everybody else? Oh, Crazy Lace, Big Snowflake! Why are they taking her here? Wouldn't it be more effective to take her to the temple where the corrupted gems are and explain it to her? And it's not bad enough that they don't explain it, they actively word it terribly. Homeworld's final attack on Earth wiped out all of the crystal gems. No, they were not all wiped out. The ones Bismuth listed were corrupted. But instead of just telling her that, they instead lead her to believe they're dead. Which leads to a major misunderstanding in both this episode and season five that really shouldn't have happened. Why lie to her this extremely for no reason? Especially when she starts screaming about it and is generally very distressed. This feels like a writing oversight, which is odd for the Crooniverse. These little transitions are a really cute nod to anime. And it's a shame they don't do anything like this outside of this one episode. But then again, it makes this episode stand out even more, so who am I to complain? It feels like an oven in here. You think it's hot now? Yeah, like an oven. I could even learn how to love. Same joke twice? It'll be really funny if she does it a third time. That's really, really good foreshadowing. I also like this training session that the Crystal Gems do here. It's a nice sneak peek back to when the Gems had to prepare more for serious battles during wartime. I feel like this episode does a really good job in general of showing us another side to the Gems as a team that we don't get to see when things are super peaceful. It's a great change of pace. Come down and show me what you're made of! I would, but this is a little intense for me. This is intense, yet dual training with Connie and fighting Amethyst isn't? Also, one of the few things I like from Future is the Crooniverse expanding on Pearl and Bismuth's relationship. And I really appreciate them planting the seeds for that with little details like Pearl blushing throughout this episode. This is cursed. Also, Bismuth and Steven are chewing here, but there's no bite taken out of their pizza slices. With this demon blade, I will be the most powerful fighter in all the world! No, Lonely Blade! Don't use it! If that thing's got infinite power, then of course Lonely Blade should use it. It just makes sense. More fantastic foreshadowing here. That's really cool. What the fuck happened to Bismuth's legs here? It's not time for the anime transition yet. Stop trying to be chibi. Everybody always tells me how great mom was. I just don't feel like I can ever measure up to her. You are different. That's what's so exciting. You don't have to be like Rose Quartz. You can be someone even better. You can be you. Scenes like this are what make this episode so special to me. It's so well written and almost perfectly describes Steven's struggles with trying to live up to his mother. The drama and emotional impact of this episode are so unique and powerful compared to the others. And we'll see much more of that later. And you know what? You deserve an even better weapon. But it is kind of stunted a tiny bit by this. You'd think that after, and I can't stress this enough, being stabbed by your leader, Bismuth wouldn't be so eager to stoke the same argument that caused her to be poofed in the first place. There's having your character be stubborn, and then there's having your character abandon all logic for drama's sake. Side note, I love this song coming up here. I can't play it, and it's about six minutes long, with most of it being atmospheric, but please give it a listen. It's called The Breaking Point. It's fantastic. It can cut through a gem's physical form in an instant, destroying the body, but never the gem. How exactly did she make it do that? What if there was just a poof gem on the floor and you tried to stab it? Would the sword just phase through it? Would it just smack against it or something? This sword is the main cornerstone and one of the biggest plot threads in this show. So you'd think they'd give it a little more explanation than just sword hit body, but not gem. We are the crystal gem! 
graphics aside, this thing looks really, really inefficient to actually try and use. Think about it. In order to use it properly, Bismuth has to be up close to her target. She has to aim it at a very specific part of a gem's body. Then it has to charge for at least a couple seconds. And then it has to hit their gemstone. The windup on it is so ungodly slow that there's nothing stopping a gem from either dodging it or counterattacking. Granted, it would combo decently with Rose's shield since she could block an attack while it charges up and that could give her an opening, but the aiming part kills it. Some gemstones are really small or hard to hit and it doesn't help that it gives a pretty clear tell of when it's going to fire. It just seems like a shitty and not great to use weapon all around. Now you look like you really mean bismuth. That's a genius payoff to the earlier joke with Amethyst. I adore the writing in this episode. Nobody's more crystal gem than I am. That's a fairly bold statement that seems a little bit out of character. I would get saying something like, I have more experience than you, so I'm more of a crystal gem than you. But saying she's more of a crystal gem than Pearl or Garnet? I don't know, I can't really picture Bismuth saying that. It is you, isn't it, Rose? You can't expect me to believe you now after you lied about everything. You're lying about this new form just like you lied to the others about me. But I didn't just disappear, did I? You know what happened to me. This part of the episode onwards, from here to the end, is probably my favorite part in all of Steven Universe. If not, then it's certainly high up there. The dialogue, the drama, the tension, the slow reveal that Rose may not be as perfect as everybody leads on. It's it's about as close to perfect as you can get. I'm probably gonna be praising many things about this scene coming up, so get ready. How could you value the gems of our enemies more than our own? And look what you've done without me, without the breaking point. You've lost! Again, ethics aside, this is a genuinely great counter-argument to Rose's strategy towards Homeworld, and in hindsight it ages really well. In Bismuth's eyes, pacifism only caused the Crystal Gems to lose the war and most of their friends as a result, and in a way it even put the whole planet in danger by not killing those who threatened its safety. But to Rose, and by extension Steven, lives being carelessly lost to revenge is a tragedy itself, and they want to avoid that as much as possible. It's a brilliant conflict of interest that pits two sides against each other, and I'd say both sides of the argument hold enough water for it to not be a simple black and white debate. This is how you write a moral dilemma, ladies and gentlemen. I don't know what she did, but I'm sure she didn't want to hurt you. It's too late. I don't believe you anymore! And this response from Bismuth is completely understandable as well when you consider the position she's in. This is going exactly the same way as it did last time, almost eerily so. And while most may think rationally enough to realize that Rose's and Steven's ideals are just similar, when that same person was someone that, in your eyes, betrayed your trust and locked you away from all you held dear until most of them were gone, this is a situation where skepticism is very warranted. And I'm glad that the crew universe explored that this time rather than pushing those questions aside like earlier. It really enriches this plot thread in the long run. All that talk about how gems could take control of their own identities, how we've been convinced to ignore our own potential, that's all it was, wasn't it? Just this part is awesome too. It explores how someone's mind can spiral when thinking through shit like this when really distressed. It makes your mind wander. It leads you to worrying about if anything else that person said was a lie. To the point where it can even lead to you questioning if their very ideals were just made up filth to begin with. Bismuth's entire purpose for living and joining the Crystal Gems was because of Rose's idea of letting gems have the freedom to do what they want to do. But by declining this weapon, it puts the idea in Bismuth's head that Rose values the lives of their enemies, enemies that will do away with the freedom of gems entirely, which Bismuth uses to justify shattering them. So with that logic, does Rose actually care about freedom? Because to Bismuth, valuing freedom seems to mean doing whatever it takes to protect said freedom. If you don't do that, then your heart isn't fully in it, and you've thus failed as a leader. Themes that are shown off now and expanded upon more later. I fucking love this scene. Though, what kind of face is Steven making here? This looks more like he's in awe at something in the sky more than he looks scared for his life. On the one hand, this plays completely perfectly to Steven's character. Attacking an opponent while simultaneously recognizing he doesn't want them to get seriously hurt, and thus shouting for them to move to minimize the damage done, that's just really cool. 
But on the other hand, how did Bismuth not hear that and then just jump out of the way? For a super powered gem, these guys sure dodge like ass sometimes. Bismuth. Why would you bring the breaking point to her? That's just begging for something bad to happen. You should have shattered me back then. At least if I were in pieces, I wouldn't have to know how little I mattered to you. You didn't even tell him. You bubbled me away and didn't ever tell your friends. My friends. I'm going to tell them. I'm going to tell them everything. <laughs> then you really are better than her. Before we get into this, I'm gonna put my one nitpick of this scene here. How was Bismuth able to talk to Steven for this long? Whenever someone else got poofed in this show, for example, when Pearl got poofed in Steven the Sword Fighter, she had nowhere near as long to say anything. This feels a little artificial for the sake of the drama, and it's a tiny bit jarring. But frankly, I don't care too much about that. This is my favorite moment in Steven Universe. This moment and its aftermath hit me really hard when I first watched this episode. To the point where it even had a stone-hearted little 14-year-old me almost in tears. It's just all so perfect. The emotional buildup and payoff is excellent, and it really helps that this is probably one of the most well-paced episodes in Steven Universe history. I know I'm really letting the nostalgia overtake me here when I say this, but this moment is one of the very few instances that takes me right back to when I watched this episode for the first time, and just how awestruck I was at the story being told. And call me biased all you want, but for being a moment this special and this effective at what it does, I think it's time I finally do this again. This episode 100% deserves it. Thank you, Kruniverse, for making this masterpiece of animation.